Well, welcome everybody to March of 2017, and this is our first Love I Told TV session. And we get to have it with some very interesting people. And then we'll let Denny introduce you all to them. Denny, take it away. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, uh, Keith, once again. And uh, and he actually brought his uh, his colleague this time, uh, uh, as Palmas, uh, Jonathan. Welcome to welcome to our show. Both both your gentlemen are from um, from uh, from Exia, um, and um, and so we we want to hear about uh, what you have to say in terms of uh, span ports and and tabs. Uh, but I, I I thought maybe I would start with asking uh, Jonathan to give us an overview and and and, and give our viewers uh, some update on kind of the the how the uh, technology of taps have evolved um, in the, in in the last few years and and you know whether or not uh, the new um, you know requirements have changed any of that um jonathan um you you were with uh, net optics before uh correct that's correct yes yeah and and that's that's uh that's actually if i'm if i understand it correctly that's one of the original uh, one of the at least one of the oldest uh, tap manufacturers yeah as far as i understand they were the ones who pioneered the whole tap niche mm -hmm. market Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, literally start with optical taps, uh, beam splitters, right? I mean, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, and and so um, so we we were just talking about how in you know things have changed. Uh, obviously, you don't you don't actually need to to uh, uh, follow uh, uh, the the political uh, reality that much to know that things have changing. Uh, how how does that affect the tap business? Yeah, so it's a good question. You know, I think over the last two, three years, we've seen uh, a, a major switch in the market to focus more on uh, performance, right? And I know that that has always been there as a requirement for anything optical based, right? You want to interrupt the signal as little as possible. You want to preserve as much light budget as possible and make sure that your data integrity is, you know, preserved across that link. But one of the big things we've seen is that there's been an increased amount of focus on it. Uh, and, you know, that has led us to innovate, you know, new versions of TAPS. And as of even recently, it's even led us to drive into looking at uh, a whole new type of TAPS. So we recently introduced a Secure Plus, which it, it adds an additional layer of security, which now you're getting into this kind of performance security meld on the FlexTAP side or FiberTAP deployments, where customers are trying to gain access everywhere in their network more pervasively than they have in the past while also limiting their risk from any sort of external threats, right? And one of the, the common things that comes up, common thread, I would say, is that even though most passive optical taps would be considered, you know, safe, high performance today that exists in the market, there's still an overall fear or even, um, you know, general feeling that the ability for someone to A, accidentally or uh, B, intentionally affect a network connection is uh, quite severe, especially for, for speaking in, you know, federal government or even into trading firms where the, the, you know, the network link needs to be preserved or, you know, they're trying to uh, keep confidential secrets separate from their, their declassified networks. So that's been the major change that I've seen. It's been uh, quite interesting to see how customers have started to deploy them and see where how much wider of a deployment that we're seeing out of the customer base in the past. I think you have some experience, I'm sure, with seeing, you know, it was typically done between switches, but we're seeing it, uh, you know, absolutely everywhere in the network now. Uh, and there's a much wider variety of taps that, you know, vendors need to supply just to meet the, the demand that's out in the market. Mm -hmm. So in, in your kind of everyday dealing with the customers, uh, do you find that most customers kind of have a, some, some adequate knowledge of why they need taps? Or do you actually have to start from zero and explain that to them? You know, it's a little bit of both, right? So there, there are certainly folks out there that are very well versed and know the products very well, or at least they know very well what they're trying to accomplish with deploying them. Uh, and then you get a little mixture of folks that are a little bit newer to it. Maybe they're, uh, they've used traditional span ports in the past, right? Uh, they have never really used TAPS, or they haven't had an out-of-band monitoring solution in their networks yet. You know, they've maybe dabbled in the inline with firewalls and IPSs, but haven't really gone into the out of band side. Uh, so I would say that's probably about 30% of the market that we see. Um, the remaining 60, 70 has some ideas to what they do. 
it's just more they may not have standardized on it completely mm -hmm. but that's beginning to shift at least at, at least from what i observe and what i believe is happening that's shifting currently if it's not shifting towards taps it's shifting in line right so there's mm -hmm. the two sides of it and and i suspect and we're that to see a lot of a lot of people grabbing on the taps even universities now are um teaching taps uh, we started with kennesaw state here and up till just recently even the uh collegiate cyber uh, defense challenge used to use span ports and uh, now we got them using taps and by the way just to make sure we got everybody on the same page the first tap was built in 1996 uh, i'm sorry 1994 by datacom and it was hot we it was co-op designed by network general which we had the first ethernet tool and unfortunately you couldn't see anything unless you had a tap and so that was the first one and it's been around taps have legitimately been around since the first one I built in 1976 mm -hmm. at uh, and that was just an RS-232 or V-35 tap. So they, they've they been around a long time. Aldad started Datacom in 1996. I know Aldad well uh, and Bob. So, uh, yeah, just taps have evolved immensely from the very beginning. I remember the first tap I saw took up a whole rack, the 19-inch space, and it was probably five inches deep or tall and could monitor one... 10 megabit line, barely, okay? <laughs> so uh, there were a lot of people who use hubs in those days too to monitor, but we found out later about real time. And I think that's been the driving force is real time. Re you know, people, much of what we do today in diagnostics is time-based. And, you know, even if you read uh, Cisco's disclaimer on span ports, you start to get a, a gleam in your eye about, hey, now I understand yeah, sure, it's free, it's available on my Switch, but it's not real-time, and it's not dedicated to that. A, a tap, a real tap, is dedicated to visibility, just like the NTO is. So, just my, my point. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tim. So, so Jonathan, that's, um, we'll, we'll come back to Spanport. We definitely have, um, we'll do that. But I, I want to continue with, with your thought on taps. And, and so you think, you, so about one third of your encounter with customers are the ones that, they're the newbies, right? They're the people that you have to really um, educate uh, mm -hmm. about why they need taps in the first place. Uh, I wanna shift that focus a bit and talk about the remaining two third, which are the people that wanted to tap and now it's your job to explain to them what makes a good tap and ultimately, you know, why net optics taps are better than others. But but before we get into the kind of the, the, the manufacturer specific um, uh, part, um, what, what makes a good tap? Yeah, so I think there's a few qualities you should look for anytime you're looking to deploy, and um, specifically more on the the optical taps. I mean, there's there's a couple varieties that are still in the market, but with everything being predominantly fiber now today, I'll, I'll focus on that. But in general, you want to look for taps that have the the lowest insertion loss performance on the fiber taps, right? Those are usually in, a good indicator of uh, uh, quality optic being used inside. Uh, meaning that any sort of transceiver variation you have in your network, it should pass the light reliably without affecting the eye or, or causing any sort of degradation to the signal. Uh, the other thing is, you, you know, you want to try and avoid some of the smaller mom and pop shops. So there's a lot, and I, nothing against small business, it's just there's a lot of small vendors that exist in the market that create very inexpensive taps that are made with uh, questionable uh, sourcing methods for the the parts, right? And we've heard that firsthand where customers have used, you know, inexpensive alternatives and it ended up not working out in the long run. Mm -hmm. The other is is really looking for a product line that helps you scale your approach over time, right? So there's there's plenty of varieties in the market that exist that you can buy it the one time, it'll fit your need for, you know, one gig today. But if you were really looking at, you know, oh, I'm going to have to adopt, you know, 10 gig and then ultimately some sort of a a 40 or 100 gig SR4 optic, you know, you have to take some thought into that because if you don't pick the right product line, you end up consuming additional rack units. And then if you really think about it, your your costs are going to go up because you've you've designed yourself into a product line that's not going to scale with you, even though the cost per tap is probably relatively low compared to everything else that's being deployed with. So that those are the, the three things that I, I would advise on. And obviously as, as a part of the third, right? If you have if a company has a good product line, does use the higher quality optics, most likely they're gonna have a, a good support organization, you know, that has folks that know what they're talking about. And that's that's really the kind of the 
3.5, point 3.5 you want to have is to make sure that that company is as knowledgeable about the products uh, as you need them to be because we've seen occurrences where it might seem like something relatively simple is happening on the network where there's an error, but it could be more complicated. Actually, go ahead. The other thing too on that, Jonathan, that can figure in is that maybe the short-term cost, it's cheaper to buy that cheaper tap, quote unquote, but your long-term mm -hmm. cost as far as troubleshooting and error uh, resolution and possibly even some security threats, that's a long-term cost that's going to figure into the total cost of ownership. So mm -hmm. you've, you've got to look at the whole situation rather than just a, a short-term initial purchase cost. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I was gonna I was gonna throw in a little bit of advertisement for for Love My Tool, which is that you know um, we when Tim and I when we started this this little venture, our, our goal was to was to educate our community, and it just turns out that educating the community um, uh, ties into selling quality product, and that's why you know our sponsors are really uh, excited to be part of a community. Is is you know you want your customer to understand the difference. Because without that understanding, it's hard to compete with the copycats, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, but but t t let's talk. Uh, let's continue. Let's continue on, Jonathan. Let's talk about um, kind of functionality of tabs now, because it. I mean, the the, the, the we're, we're gone a long way now, right? From having just a, a, a single point, single output kind of tab, right? Tabs has kind of evolved. What 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 it, what has been that evolution? Yeah, so there's been, uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure it's, uh, the exact history, but the, you know, over the last, say, three, four years, there was a change in terms of, um, you know, with the, the point, the single tap output, you know, with the single network link, right, that, that's evolved in the performance side and needing that, right? And then there's this other side of the market where customers are still looking for a single quality reliable device to make multiple outputs. And uh, we've seen that evolution on our, what we call a regeneration tap, or it can be referred to as a multi-output tap. Basically where customers, and, and we've seen it predominantly in the federal space, you know, are deploying these things into environments where they may not have a large amount of space for, you know, uh, big packet brokers or even, you know, different types of tools that they would normally have in the main core of their network. And so they leverage something like a regen where it comes in built with all the same network tap functions that we have on the standard passive opticals, you know, single output taps. Uh, and then it allows them to have up to, you know, multiple different tools to look at the same traffic so they can see all the, the necessary bits of the, the net, you know, the data that's flowing across that network uh, without having to, you know, if they don't have the resources on site or anything like that to go install additional equipment. We've also seen uh, a change in the aggregation market heavily. So going back a little bit, there was a initially a heavy push to have uh, taps that had aggregation capabilities built into it. Now, one of the things that's happened over the last few years is we've seen that kind of transition away where now it's, it's going back to having a, a high quality, relatively low cost fiber tap uh, product that sits in front of a packet broker versus having the two merge together. So we've seen a dissection of that uh, functionality in the market where now it's going back to specialize. So the pack brokers do the aggregation and the regen and the filtering, whatever else, and the taps focus on preserving that light quality and just making 100% of the copies of all that traffic reliably without introducing any sort of active components that could interrupt that, that signal. So those are the two kind of, I'd say, divergent paths we've seen. So regen is still relatively specialized and used, but aggregations is somewhat uh, changed and, and evolved the way over the past few years. Mm -hmm. Actually, it, that's an interesting discussion because that, that, that this this is to me this is like you know the more it changes the more it just stays the same mm -hmm. because when when we start when I started my last company um, we had to kind of sell into an environment where um, you know there's the network there's the tap and then there's the tools and we kind of in the middle which you know when what we built was something that Garner is now called a packet broker a name that would stay with us forever I think but the point is that um, what we often do is is try to convince the customers that they really want to keep the tap simple because after all the tap is the network element right and mm -hmm. and and this is you know like uh, why change why ch you know don't change the airframe and the air the engine at the same time right mm -hmm. one thing at a time so it's interesting i find it very interesting now that as you said that some of the customers actually coming back to that right they want to keep everything 
keep all the functionalities um, uh, in, uh, uh, independent. Um, so um, how, how does span port um, play into your kind of discourse with the customer? How, how do you, what, when does the issue of span port comes up? So, you know, in, in most occurrences, span port is usually something that's already been implemented or being used, right? It's, I don't think I've ever encountered a, a customer where they're thinking about deploying it versus a tap and they haven't deployed it already. They these, Usually it's something that's already being leveraged. It's already something that they've, you know, they've gotten for free, quote unquote. Uh, and usually the discussion is more around talking through the evolution of their network over time, right? If things were to stay frozen in one place, the span ports usually work uh, well, as good as they'll work, right? They won't necessarily do everything that you need, but if you're frozen in that one portion of time, it'll it'll do okay. Uh, but then when you start to get into, you know, you need to make sure that you're getting, you know, quality data to your, your monitoring side or your security side so you can actually see what's going on. And you want to start talking about, well, what's going to happen as your traffic, you know, rates rise? How are you going to effectively monitor your diverse architecture and as, as that grows, right? And using span ports becomes increasingly more complicated and expensive. And so it comes back to the whole cost and performance side. And again, the, the performance threat is gonna be very, very common for anything related to taps. It's, it's probably the number one theme that any tap manufacturer needs to have on their mind. The second is, you know, when we get into the customers, is the cost side. It's just, it's not a cost effective method to use span pervasively across a network. Um, and then lastly, it, it also isn't going to give you the data integrity that you need when you have something like a tap, where you can put it into any sort of environment. You can guarantee that you're going to see all the traffic. You can use any variety that you need based on what's evolving in the network. I mean, heck, there's even taps for the, the Cisco 40 gig by you know, uh, networks that exist. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of communicating, OK, today you have this, but where are you going to go tomorrow? And then where are you going to go even beyond that? And how do you accommodate some things that you don't even foresee occurring, right? If the growth in your network is uh, faster than anticipated, if you don't have an effective way to scale it, you're going to run into problems. And it's going to be costly for you to uh, adapt to that. But if you have a way to just deploy more taps and get more access, that's a much more cost-effective solution than trying to buy more switches to get more span ports. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and then I think, as Jonathan said earlier, it's about uh, educating people. Even if they know about taps, it's like, do you understand, and spans, do you understand the quality impacts of span? Do you understand that it's an active device? It's actively going to go in there and modify or even not pass along some of the information. And I've talked to people at trade shows and, and at other places, and they some get it, but a vast majority don't. They're like, well, a span is the same as a tap. And it's like, no, there's definite... Um, impacts to your to the quality of your data if you use a span port. Now you know a, a span has uh, some advantages here and there, maybe convenience at times. But uh, when you look at the total aggregate um, cost or impacts of what's going on, spans can have a definite, uh, uh, in my mind, detraction from the quality of the data. They're going to affect timestamps. They're going to have other impacts. And you need to understand that because it's going to affect the quality of your data and you may be missing data or you may get uh, data that's got different timestamps and you're trying to figure that out. It takes you longer for troubleshooting. You, you're, if, and if you are going to use spans and taps, you need to understand that so that you can, when say, segregate the data, but at least you understand where the data is coming from, which data source, so you understand how to interpret some of the information about it. Mm -hmm. well, and well, plus, it, it's an active device. and. You don't want anything as your security monitor access or even your application monitoring access uh, to have the potential of being hacked. A tap is not a network device. It is isolated, doesn't have an IP address, and you want to keep it that way because that way, you know, in any security environment, you want everything. You can filter down using advanced packet brokers. I hate that term, but you can filter down to look at certain things, but if you don't have it, and even Cisco's... Uh, not too long ago, did a, a, a demonstration at uh, one of the uh, Black Hat things, and they showed how easy it was to either RAM charge or just take down a switch, one of theirs, uh, or anybody else's switch, and then reprogram it. Uh, so it's, yeah, I, I know if I'm in a company and I'm working with them on anything, especially security, I require taps uh, because that's the only way you're going to see what's going on. 
in today's world with all the real-time protocols and, you know, measurements of Blumois, saws, QOE, QOXs, you know, everything. Mm -hmm. You can't do that unless you have a device that gives you real timing. And I, and, I, and, and a lot of people say, well, nothing does it. They're right. It's relative timing. It's consistent timing. Uh, every time you touch any packet, any data, any bit byte, nimble rock tech, you're actually changing its time existence in, in, in a scientific manner. So you just want to get the very best you can get, or you're not going to be able to really protect your network. Well, I think I think it's important to to kind of remind us our, our different back that we have different background, right? So so like Jonathan comes from the tap side of the business, Tim comes from the tool side of the business, and I believe Keith and I are a little bit similar in that we came from what used to be called the aggregator or now called yes. packet broker. So I remember um, back in the days when I was selling for my last company, we the one thing that we don't want to do is we don't want to make a religious uh, issue our span port versus tap because we don't really care, right? Data comes in, data goes out, right? We, we don't really care if they come from the span port or the tap as long as we can sell our box, right? Now, of course, Tim on the other side, he's receiving data from, from us and we're getting data from either span port or tap. So he cares a great deal about where the data comes from, right? And so, um, but I, I do remember that um, back in the days, um, a customer would come to us and, and 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 the one thing that I noticed is that if it, it really has to do, and this is going back to I think one of the things that Jonathan said is that it really has to, a lot to do with the network utilization. You know, if, if they're down at the five ten percent network utilization, Spanport is not such a best solution, right? And of course, that's what Cisco wants to do, right? Cisco really wants you to utilize it at the five ten percent because they want to sell you more equipment. <laughs> so. Um, um, so how do we, how do we, so we have a, a kind of a list of things that we want to cover um, that talks about um, kind of span port versus, uh, versus tap. Um, some of that is, is kind of a, a new, some of that is, is uh, uh, some of that is kind of old and some of that is kind of new. Um, who, who wants to lead on that discussion? Tim, you want to, you want to do it? Good. Yeah, why don't you? No, no. Yeah. I want them to talk about, it. I'll just, I'll just be the preacher. I'm the tap preacher. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start it off. Okay, I mean, keep, yeah, keep, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So, so basically, like I said, to me, it's just about education. To, to your point, um, from my perspective, a span in some ways is as good as a tap, but in the, you know, others it isn't. And I just wanted to call out that to people so that they understand and they make a choice. What's right for them, you know, that's up to them. But like one of the things that uh, some people don't understand, unless they've really dealt with it much, is that spans are going to create some duplicated packets. So if you get that duplication, you're going to need a packet broker or some other device to really go in and remove the duplicates. Otherwise, you're going to get duplicate data flooding your tools. And that, like you said earlier, that's where Tim and others who from the tool side are going to look at this and it's like, okay, so I've got all these duplicate duplicate packets, I don't need it. I've got to get rid of them. Guess what? If I have to do it from the tool side, I'm going to use extra CPU cycles and all of this functionality just to delete data and not spend it on processing the data and coming up with some sort of conclusion or whatever. So that's one of the big things. Um, spans also provide summarized data. So, and then also the, um, not they don't create a complete copy of the data. So if you're looking for some of the layer one information, if you're looking for um, things like that that you may need for troubleshooting, just be aware it may not be there from your span data, and it may actually be in your network. So it's not that the network's not sending it, that the the devices aren't generating it. It's just you're not seeing it. You just need to be cognizant of it. Another one is CLI programming is required for the span ports. So. If you're not prepared for that, that's an extra cost, extra time, and just doing some of those CLI filters to filter the data, go into the tools, that can get pretty tricky. I know uh, uh, Tim's got a lot of experience in that, but that's something that it not only takes time, but uh, to go and validate the data to make sure it's correct, that can take you a lot of time as well. And then as Tim mentioned, the other big one to me was that span ports have been shown to be uh, hackable. Um, I, I forget where that was, if that was a shark fest or something, but they, they did a demonstration Black, on that. Black Hat has done it several times. So. Black Hat. 
Now, you brought up a good point, though. You know, a lot of it's about education. And, yeah, you can take a span port and you can do your uh, IP list, even maybe a dependencies list, okay? But let's say if you're doing a benchmark, let's say you're doing an application benchmark, you need real time to be able to establish the parameters of what is viable uh, measurement for quality of experience or quality of service or any of that kind. So if time, if the T shows up in any of your diagnostics, you need to get a tap uh, and, and a real tap, okay? Because there are people out there that are from other countries that sell a tap um, and they're really actually just uh, very simple span ports that are using a Broadcom or one of the very good, some of them use very good span, uh, chip sets, uh, but that's not a tap, okay? That's like a span port. Um, so, I, and, 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 and please don't misunderstand us. We don't dislike span. Span has viability. First off, it's everywhere, okay? But you just have to understand uh, that, you know, if you really want time-based information, a span is not the tool of choice. And if that if that switch is very busy, you're not going to get a lot of packets out of it. It's going to groom those packets, and it's going to get them out in any way it can, any time it wants. It'll drop packets, and, and a lot of people do by dedupe, but they find out later that the duplicate packets are actually being caused by their switch or their router, but usually by a switch. Mm -hmm. So Keith, you're right on. Well, to me, to me, the, the discussions on span port versus tap isn't really so much about like or dislike or personal like or personal dislike. It, it's really, to me, is is chain of evidence, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. And your packet is your evidence. And so the question is, how does that, you know, get it? You're the investigator. And if you care a great deal about the chain of evidence, then you know there's one 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 decision, and if you say I don't care, that's another decision, right? Um, but um, I want to I want to kind of uh, um, go back to go back to kind of packet broker, right? The aggregator, and um, in some way, right? Selling. I mean, if the, if if uh, what are the functionalities that that uh, we have to come up with these days? Um, the kind of neutralize the span port. I mean, if, if, if that's what what customer wants to have, we talk about the duplicate packet, Keith. What else? What, mm -hmm. are, the, what are the features now that, that we have to kind of throw into that space, the, the aggregator space, to kind of make it make sense for the tools? Well, a part of it is the aggregation, because to me, the, the span ports coming off the switch are probably going to be in your core network. So, Okay, you get data there, but what if you want data from the ingress or egress? You know, or are you pulling those from the span ports? I doubt it. So you're probably going to need to put taps or something out there. Well, now with the packet broker, you can aggregate the data from the taps at the ingress, egress, and span ports in the core if you want, plus so uh, taps or uh, virtual taps if you want to pull some from your virtual data center. You can pull all of this information together, aggregate it in the packet broker, and then send that on to the tool. And part of that's the the aggregation to get the right data to the to the tool that it needs. But the great thing there too is, if you don't have that, you're going to have to connect the, the NPP. You're going to have to connect the tool up to the span port or to all these taps. And you've only got so many ports on a tool. And then you know how are you physically even going to get some of that data there? You may have to put multiple tools out on different spans across your network, and then you get into a cost. Uh, issue there, whereas the NPB will give you cost savings from that aggregation and the, um, like I said, the deduplication and all of that. Mm -hmm. That to me is a, just a fundamental thing I keep coming back to when I look at mm -hmm. spans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Jonathan or Tim have any other uh, pearls of wisdom they want to throw out there. I, I think you, you hit it right on the head. I mean, it, I it's too. about getting that aggregation outside of, you know, trying to feed in multiple links into a set of tools. I mean, the way I always describe it, if you're if you're looking at any sort of a TAP deployment, just speaking on TAP specifically, you know, you don't always want to feed that directly into a tool because it's a bit like feeding a tool from a fire hose. I mean, you, you've got a, a large pipe, a lot of data most likely, and in depending on what it is that you're trying to hook up, it's probably a lot of data it doesn't need to see. Uh, so leveraging that aggregation layer to then do things like filtering or deduplication is is where you want to keep it, right? And I, I think that's 100% accurate. Now, now that, that, did, that is another thing, too, I would hit on is the filtering capability in some of the NPBs using a GUI so much easier than trying to use CLI for to configure span ports. 
you know, the, the drag and drop and the point and click interfaces on, on some of the NPVs, especially like the one we've got from Ixia, just if you actually go in and do that versus going into the uh, uh, the CLI programming for span, oh my God, it's like a night and day difference. Just the ease and the speed with which you can create the filters and then modify them. Well, one thing we need to remind uh, our viewer also is that, uh, you know, programming the CLI for the span port, it sounds easy, but it's a different team. Okay, this is this is like you know going to the other side of the aisle. You know, you gotta they report the different vice president. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it's not this is not technology anymore, right? This is really uh, dealing with you know uh, uh, a lot of uh, issues in the company. Hey guys, um, we're just past the half hour mark. I like to keep this show short so our viewers um, so we don't put a lot of uh, demand on the on the viewers. Um, I wonder if I could give a chance uh, to Keith because kind of something Keith said that kind of um, uh, uh, let me think about the division of of Exia, right? Because Exia started as a two company. But now you kind of have a very full spectrum of products, tabs, brokers, tools. How, how do, what does that mean to the customer? Uh, so basically that means we're looking at a, a holistic um, approach. It's not just focusing on one area. It's how do all three areas focus. So you've got the data access, you've got the data uh, control layer with the NPB and, and, and manipulating the data so that you can send it to the right tools. And then you've got that monitoring layer with the tools. So we understand all three areas, how they interact, and how you need to, to get the uh, information from one to another, and really what the requirements are from each stage on to the next. I mean, it'd be great to say, hey, I've got a tool, and it does all this, and that's it. But you've got to filter the data going into it, and then you've got to get the data and the right quality of the data to go into that. And then before I forget, I just wanted to mention for anybody who wants more information on what we talked about, go to our website at Dixie.com. We've got some white papers, some solution briefs on like tap versus span and, and tap and white papers on tap planning. There's all sorts of stuff there that can help you out. It's all free. Yeah, yeah, we, we actually have that uh, in the show notes. So uh, yep. yeah, everybody's welcome to do that. Hey, um, I wonder, Keith, if, if I could kind of extend our invitation and say, hey, why don't we do a part three of, of this uh, uh, series of, of uh, discussions and, and focus on kind of what you just said, you know, it's just, you know, we got the data now. Uh, some of them come from Spanport, some of them come from TAP. We know what we need to do in terms of uh, delivering those uh, those evidence, those packets into the tools. What does the what what are the features you know that that we now come up with on the aggregator on the on the, in the middle? That I think sounds that would good. Be a, that, I think that yeah. would be a great discussion. Yeah, and, sounds uh, good. We, we, should we, we should definitely yeah we should I definitely we invite uh, Jonathan back, right? Well, if we have to, I guess we can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, I'd nice be happy to be he, he, he sees too much of it as it is, but what, what the heck, we'll do it. Well, okay, well, with that, Tim, um, can you can you give us the final word and close your show for us? Yeah, first off, uh, just one case in point that Keith mentioned, how wonderful it is, how easy it is to, to do a, a simple CLI. Uh, years ago, I wrote an article that's been read about four or 5,000 times, and I actually delineated a small CLI to capture just one IP address. And I purposely put two big errors, major errors in the coding. And to this date, no one has ever called me and said, hey, that CLI you wrote, it won't work. <laughs> so that kind of tells you right there that it's not just something you do when you're uh, ready to go to bed at night and you just want to clear your mind of everything. Uh, so command line is can be very difficult very powerful for setting up uh, switches and that. See, and But what's amazing is even Cisco, the founder of CLI basically is moving to GUI. So that kind of tells you where the market's going. Uh, you know, but you mentioned data. I'm a cyber forensics investigator and I would never ever, I could never go to court, even civil or criminal court and say, oh, I got this data from a span port and not be ready to get my rear end handed to me by a good attorney. So if you're involved in any kind of legal technology uh, or you know any kind of investigative discovery or whatever, use a tap, it'll save you from embarrassment in the courtroom. Uh, and uh, it'll also make you feel confident that the data you got was the real data. 
if you're doing things like baselining, which I think everybody should do, you, you need a tap. Uh, you know, and tap just makes your world better. So I know it's a little expensive, but I think the last time I saw a financial study on taps, it was about one to 5% of the cost of what you're investing in a network. And I don't know many people that would go out and buy a brand new car if there wasn't a warranty. And there wasn't any way to see if you had oil, if you had gas, if you, you're know, overheating car or something. So it's just kind of fits into our social demands. Uh, other than that, I mean, I do firmly believe that this is a important. Well, I was one of the drivers of us getting the taps for sniffers back when I had hair. Well, no, I never had hair, but whatever. Uh, yeah, so Keith told you you got some things. I wrote the first article that actually compared tap versus span versus hub versus vacle. Uh, and I put that up. That was one of our first articles. I think one of Denny. Yes. 2007. Yes. Yep. So it's still there. It's been read a few times. It's been leaked to about 9,000 sites. Uh, it's been used by a lot of university and colleges. And I've, I've given Keith a lot of that information. It's always available. Um, and we'd love you to, you know, talk about it. If you talk about something, you learn about it. Jonathan, thank you for everything. Uh, it's nice to have you around. Uh, and Keith, of course, Keith and I have been working together on a lot of stuff and a uh, great friend to have. So y'all be blessed out there. Take care and think about how you want to get your data. Do you want the real data or do you want the pseudo data? <laughs> Okay, well, with that, we close the show. Thanks, thanks once again. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Jonathan. And uh, thank you, Tim. And uh, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.